Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another Indie Game Friday, where each week I take a look at a different independent computer role-playing game. As I head into the last few episodes of the year, I'm going to take a look at another of the Spiderweb software games, Nethergate Resurrection, initially released back in 2008. Nethergate Resurrection is a typical, top-down, turn-based, text-heavy, isometric, party-based, Spiderweb software RPG, and uses what appears to be their second-tier engine, not quite modern, but perhaps not as clunky as some of their earliest offerings. The skill system is clearly derived from the Avernum series, with its own modifications that I will touch on, but where it differs is that instead of some truly fantastical background setting, it uses a sort of alternate history background, set during the Roman conquest of Britain during the reign of Nero, with fantasy elements installed. In terms of plot, the game starts during the reign of Nero, as I mentioned, where the Celtic tribes of Britannia are rebelling under Queen Boudicca. You are given the choice between playing the Roman or the Celtic side, effectively allowing two different storylines to play through the game, each of which has their own minor modifications and takes on how the game itself plays, as well as their own approaches to what's going on. You create a small group of up to four characters, which are then sent to a mysterious valley under uncertain orders. There, they clash not only with their enemy faction, but also with the forces of the supernatural. When you create your characters, you can make up to four of them, although there are six party slots available in the game proper. All the primary characters are human, so there's no selecting races, and there's no classes involved, leaving character advancement purely to skills, traits, and other similar things. So when you craft a character, you can select a name, an icon, a portrait, and then edit statistics. Each character has a list of skills in five categories, although one of those categories is reserved for skills that you learn during play. Some of the categories also have unknown skills to be learned during the game as well, if you can. The basic skills are akin to your basic attributes. Strength, dexterity, intelligence, and endurance, all of which influence aspects of play. Then there's the weaponry skills that simply increase chance to hit and damage with particular types of weapons, or increase certain defenses. Roman characters tend to be better at physical fighting than the Celtic ones. Druid skills are your basic magic skills of the game, each offering access to and increasing the effectiveness of certain groups of spells. Celts tend to be better at general magic. Then there's useful skills, which include crafting, treating wounds, and picking locks, as well as general luck. Aside from these skills, characters also have a list of resistances that they have protection from. There's fire, cold, magic, mental, and poison slash acid, each of which provides resistances to a different sort of elemental attack. Characters also get useful attributes, maximum health, spell energy, which is used for spells, resist poison, resist magic, willpower, and elemental resistance, which allows you to resist certain attacks entirely, and then rune reading, which lets you read unknown runes that you come across and possibly decipher things from them. Then there's character traits. You start with one, and they function as a basic boost to one particular element of play, which can be used to dramatically differ character playstyles. Other things visibly on the sheet are mo- that are mostly for review during play. There's special items acquired during quests and such during play. There's a list of druid spells that you learn. There's potions that your character knows how to make. Abilities that you earn during play. And currently active quests. The same character sheet can be accessed during play, where it also shows the character's level, the experience needed to level up, and the unused skill points. Unused skill points are used to increase skills, with each level costing increasing numbers of skill points to boost. The last thing you can select during uh, the character creation process is the overall game difficulty, from easy to torment. Once you have your party created, you are given a cutscene of the typical spider web software form, mostly just background text catching you up on the storyline with some illustrations and then you enter the game proper. When you get in, the interface is similar to other spiderweb software games of that era. There's the party list in the upper left with six party slots. Each has the character's portrait, their health, and spell points if necessary, a button to train them if they have skill points available, and to switch their order in the party. This is where you can also click on individual characters to select them for using items while you're exploring. Below this is the character location and day, and then below that is the selected character's inventory. There's a paper doll to equip items on the left, with equipment slots revealed only when you drag items onto them, as well as your overall carrying capacity. Each character has a limited amount of weight that they can carry. To the right of the paper doll is a list of what the character is carrying. In normal mode, you can mouse over these items to see what they are, hit the question mark icon to see more details, or you use item to actually use them. 
If you wish to equip an item, you'd simply drag it over to your character's paper doll and drop it on them, and it'll automatically equip it into an appropriate slot. If you wish to drop an item, drag it onto the main display. You can also toggle the inventory area to display the map area if you have a map. A quick note on weapons and armor. Armor functions as general damage reduction in this game and just reduces all damage you take by a certain percentage, while weapons have a damage range that varies and can be improved upon based on your skills. The right-hand side of the screen is dominated by the isometric view of the area, with north being in the upper right-hand side. Below this are the text block that shows messages as they are received, and beneath this are the interface icons. Each of these icons may be accessed by a hotkey and are, in order, the look slash search slash use command, the cast a spell command, wait a turn, talk, get items, toggle combat, use an ability, read the journal, view the map, general instructions, and then the save slash load slash options menu. Many of these items open up several submenus, such as casting a spell or using a particular ability, which you can then select either a spell or ability and then a target on the map. Some of them go direct into selecting a target, such as use an item or talk to an item. These act as they do in similar spiderweb software games, with characters walking around in the primary directions in a turn-based way, the ability to use items that you are near to search slash examine them if you are, you know, going to be approaching a door or a particular switch or lever or more often just a container. The get an item offers just a list of items on the ground slash out in the open for you to select from. So you don't have to worry about clicking on individual little icons, or little pixels and such on the screen. Maneuvering around the map is turn-based, as I mentioned, and maps can transition to an overworld map once you leave a settlement, which functions similarly but is on a different scale. During play, you'll often trigger dialog boxes, either by entering a scripted area or by talking to people. This generally pops up a large, more descriptive box of text, with dialog options as necessary to advance whatever you're looking at. During an actual dialog, you can click an icon to write in your journal if you feel you need to take note of what you're seeing. You can also find merchants who offer a way to buy and sell gear. These generally just list the available gear on the right, while you can directly access your individual character's inventory on the left, except the Use button has been replaced with a Sell button. During exploration, you'll occasionally come across enemies. Combat is handled on the exploration map just natively. Enemies are active as you explore, taking their turns alternating with yours. If you are near enough to fight, you can toggle combat mode on, which then breaks out each of your characters into their own turn and allows them to break formation. Your turns are based on your party formation overall instead of any initiative. During each combat turn, each character has a set number of action points, and that can limit their overall movement, as well as what actions they have available to take. Casting spells is done just as it is in exploration mode, selecting a spell from a list and then selecting a target. Attacking an enemy can be accomplished by running into them if you're meleeing them, or by using the fire a weapon to use your ranged weapon, mostly slings and javelins. Once there are no enemies in range, you can toggle out of combat. Actually, you can do so even if there are enemies within range, but then you only get your selected character's actions, so it would probably behoove you to stay in combat mode to allow all of your characters to act. Combat mode can also be useful in other instances, when having multiple characters acting at once is important. Finishing quests and killing enemies awards you experience, and when you reach certain levels, you are awarded additional skill points, as well as additional health and spell points. You can train at basically any time, and save up skill points between levels to afford more advanced skills. During play, you can also uncover additional skills, spells, and recipes for craftable items, although there aren't exactly a lot of these such things. Still, it's a useful bonus for those who are fond of exploring and do well at doing so. So, overall, it's a very simple RPG in terms of mechanics. How's the presentation? Well, it's a spiderweb software game, which means it has retro-style simplistic isometric graphics, the occasional illustration, and a lot of hand-drawn black-and-white cartoon-style illustrations. This makes the game look fairly amateurish in a lot of ways, not necessarily because the illustrations themselves are particularly bad, although the black and white ones could use some improvement, but simply how they clash with each other. If it was all one or all the other, it would be much better. Then again, if you're playing a spiderweb software game, it's pretty much par for the course and you're probably used to it by now. The music, where it occurs, is alright, with most ca maps simply having some sort of atmospheric ambient sound instead. The interface is is crude, to say the least. Although, due to the simplicity of the system overall, it works well enough. I feel that in a more mechanically cumbersome system, the interface would work against the game more, but then again, that's something I've said in multiple of these games. So, like all spiderweb software games, the real focus is on the storyline and the writing. 
Nethergate Resurrection does pretty well in this regard, with solid writing and a setting that mingles fantasy with historical elements. It implements a fair amount of history and myth from the Roman era of Britannia while going on its own way. I'd say that it's different enough from other classic fantasy RPGs because of this, but honestly, a lot of the Avernum stuff seems to be Roman-inspired, so while it is certainly more historically based than Spiderweb Software's other games, at least in part, it doesn't actually feel that different. The equipment certainly has a period flavor and is more apt to what you'd find during the time period, especially regarding the armor and missile weapons. But a lot of the other touches, you know, the magic system, for instance, just seems so familiar and similar to Avernum's magic system that... A few names have been changed and replaced, and some flavor has been added, but other than that, it's it, it, it feels very much like the other Spiderweb software games. That having been said, Nethergate is actually pretty solid, and the fact that it's a standalone style story that doesn't interact with a series can be beneficial for those who are looking to sample Spiderweb software's games. When you look at the six-game series of Avernum and Geneforge, or even the three entries of the Avedon series, it can be a little bit intimidating, whereas Nethergate stands on its own. It does have a little bit of replayability as well, since you can play through as either the Romans or the Celts to see one side of the story, and then play through the other side to get a more complete look. In this way, it has a fair amount of value, especially if you can get it on sale. Even though it is an older game, if you can handle the graphics, it is well worth a couple bucks. And on that note, I will wrap it up here. This has been the RPG Crawler with Indie Game Friday Nethergate Resurrection, and this will be the last Spiderweb software game I cover for quite some time, although I may take a look at the Avedon series sometime in the next year. As always, I will put a link to where you can check it out below. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content, both tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye. And if you're still watching this far, I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have supported this channel via Patreon or direct donations throughout the years, without which this channel could not have lasted as long as it has. For those who are feeling particularly generous, you can still support my work through Patreon and now through Subscribestar as well, through the links in the description below.